Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at just a couple of verses, but I'll read beginning in verse 14 so that we can see the context of those verses. Ephesians chapter 3. When I was a, a boy, my dad, who is, remains to this day the best dad that I know um, in terms of godliness and servant-heartedness and affection, every Thanksgiving, when the Thanksgiving meal was completed and we would head to bed, he would stay up all night having collected a large number of cardboard boxes through trips to Walmart and back then Circuit City and all kinds of stores that don't exist anymore. Um, and he would construct what he called a box fort. He would clear out one room of the house and push the furniture all to the wall. He would build mazes and so forth. They got more and more complex over the years. So that we woke up the next morning we would have to go explore it and, and figure out where all the rooms were. My dad's a pretty both mischievous and ingenious individual. So inevitably, as we would explore, we would come bustling out, me and my brothers, and say, hey, here's what we found. We found this room and that room. And inevitably, he would say, you didn't find it all yet. There's more. So we would go back in and try to find some hidden door or some secret compartment that he had concealed from us. Then we'd come back again. Okay, we found this and this. And sometimes even then he'd say, no, there's more. So it is with the love of God. There is always more for us to see. And so great is God's heart that we would see it that he placed a prayer on the lips of the Apostle Paul that Christians would be strengthened by the Spirit of God specifically for this purpose, to know more of God's love. It is, as it were, God saying, there is more, and I want you to know it. We're going to be looking at the second half of verse 17 and verse 18 in Paul's prayer to the Ephesian church where Paul prays that they would be strengthened to know what is the breadth and height and length and depth, to know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge. But for the sake of context, I'm going to read the entire prayer beginning in verse 14. Let's remember this is God's word. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. There's more to see. There is more to see. This is a prayer. It's a magnificent prayer. It's a prayer worth studying. And I actually would encourage you, as we're studying prayer as a church, I would encourage you to study Paul's prayers. And if you want help to that end, you can uh, get a book called Praying with Paul by D.A. Carson. It used to be called A Call to Spiritual Reformation. It's an outstanding book just of studying the prayers of Paul and how we can be informed in our own prayers by imitating Paul. Well, this is a magnificent Pauline prayer. 
Uh, it, it is overwhelming. And for the sake of context, I just want to give an overview. Paul, Paul begins in verse 14 by humbling himself, bowing his knees. It would be in that culture a, a clear indication that he's praying to a king, the highest king. And so he bows his knees before the Father, which is a reminder both of his authority and of his ownership of all things, and in particular of his people, his adoption of them that Paul has already referenced in chapter 1. He prays that according to the riches of God's glory, that that would be the standard with which they are strengthened. He prays that no other or lesser standard than God's own riches of glory, all the riches of his attributes, would be the standard with which these requests are met. And then he makes three basic requests. One is that they would be strengthened with power through the Spirit in their inner being with the aim or goal or result or companion truth that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith doesn't mean they're not already indwelt by the Spirit of Christ. It just means that it requires strengthening by the Spirit for us to be what we already are, the temple of Jesus Christ through His Spirit. So he's praying for strength that that magnificent reality would take place enduringly in their life. Then the second request that we'll cover in more detail, that they would know, they would know the love of Christ in all of its infinite fullness. And then the final <laughs> incredible request, that they would be filled with the fullness of God. He, he prays this final daring request that every believer has the right to pray for, that we would have more of God in our life, that whatever we know of him, we would know more of him. One way you could summarize this entire prayer is that Paul is praying for God's people to have more of God, more of his strength for the indwelling presence of Christ, more knowledge of his love, more of God's fullness in their life. He's praying for God's people to have more of God, and he ends this prayer with an explosion of worship that God is able to do more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the resurrection power that he's already referenced in chapter one that is at work within the church that he would receive glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. It, it is a magnificent prayer, and right in the center of it is this magnificent request. He prays that they would know the infinite love of Jesus Christ. He prays that they would know the infinite love of Jesus Christ because, as he might put it, there is more and you need to know more of the love of Christ. You need to know more. Only God can reveal it to you. So we are praying that God would show us more of his love. Let's walk through this particular request with greater detail. First of all, he notes that this prayer comes to a people that have been rooted, notice there in verse 17, the second half, have been rooted and grounded in love. So he's, he's not praying that they would begin to be loved by God. He, he's already told the Ephesian church that God chose them before the foundation of the world, that he loved them, that he adopted them as his own. These are a loved people, just as Christians here are. They were loved. They were rooted. He had rooted them. It has the idea of a, a growing tree root that is, is growing because it's rooted in the nourishing reality of God's love. He also says they were established. That has a building idea in mind. They've been grounded or founded in God's love. So they are already loved as a people. God has loved them. They have been placed in the establishing and rooting reality of God's choosing, undeserved, unmerited love. That's that's the reason they're receiving this letter. Because God has loved them before the foundation of the world as his own people. He has loved them though they were sinners. He has made them alive. He has placed them in his love. And they, along with their brothers and sisters, Jews and Gentiles, have been made a people. And they are the people of God's love. They are rooted and grounded in love. And it, it's worth noting that this ought to be the confidence for all of our prayers. That we are rooted and grounded in love. Too often, I think we pray with a, a level of uncertainty about the disposition of God towards us. But this accurate statement of our reality ought to ground and root our own prayers even as we are grounded and rooted in God's love. 
Paul is saying to these Ephesian believers, though he wants them to know more of God's love, God loves you. He has established you. He has, we can put it this way, he has cemented you into God's love. You have been built into a foundation. The cement has dried. The roots have gone deep. God loves you. Now that changes the disposition of a prayer of of a Christian, a prayer for a Christian. He's saying, I'm praying for those that have been cemented in to the love of God. They're not, a, they're not a leaf blowing around uncertain and unclaimed. They're not an orphan with no one watching out for them. They're not a, a rebel who's hoping only to avoid capture. They are a loved one rooted and established and cemented in into God's love. This is already true of them. And it introduces the reality that though we are loved by God, we don't yet know all there is to know about the love that loves us. It it, it pushes away, this passage pushes away from any kind of complacency in the knowledge of the gospel of God's love. Because one thing can be true of us and yet we don't know it as fully as we ought to know it. That, that's true of the gospel in many ways. We know that we've received God's grace, but we don't know all of God's grace that we ought to know. We know that God is holy, but we don't know all of God's holiness that we ought to know. The Christian life is a knowing more of what you know kind of life. It's a being more of what you are kind of state of being. And here, he's talking about love. He's saying, you, you are loved. You're grounded in love. You're rooted in love, but You haven't begun to know all of the love that has loved you. I'm not praying that you would be loved. You already are loved, but I'm praying for you to know the fullness of that love that is towards you in Christ. They are rooted. They are grounded. This is the foundation of our prayers. Let me encourage you that you would begin your prayers with some reference, mental reference, vocal reference of the love that is towards you in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in Christ himself. It's a helpful way to begin there because it it will change the way you approach God in your prayers. In this passage, he's talking about love. You could talk about uh, the righteousness that you have in Christ or God's adopting love towards you or the grace you have that your sins have been forgiven. I would encourage you, find some way, some simple way to reference that as you begin your prayers because it will change the nature of your approach to God. Parents, I would encourage you to begin your prayers with some simple reference of your confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the love of God towards you. We, we don't want to think that every time we come to prayer, we're reverting to that state of pre-conversion where we're coming for the first time as, as those who are unsure and are doubting of God's love and grace towards us. No, we stand in the love of God when we come, even when we come to confess our sin that has distorted the fellowship that we have with God. We still stand in God's love. This is a root that cannot be broken. This is a foundation that cannot be cracked. Even when we are sinning, we are loved by God. Let me encourage us to come with this kind of foundation in our souls that is the foundation for every Christian. Now, though they are grounded in love, they have not yet fully comprehended the extent of that love. They've been established, but their perspective is limited. Christians who are in the love of Christ have, have a narrow and limited perspective on that love. They have not seen it all yet. You, I, we have not seen the fullness of his love yet. We have not. They need, notice this, they need strength. They cannot even know this on their own. They've gotten to the end of the tunnel of their own capacity, and Paul is praying that God would expand their abilities so they can see more. Now, this is a humbling reality. You don't even have the ability to know more of God's love toward you. 
Now, we're used to thinking that we don't have the ability to see all of our sin because our hearts are deceitful and we're not sure if we've seen everything that others see in us. Yes, we're used to that. Here's a humbling thought. You can't even explore all of God's love without God's. Even the goodness of seeing God's love is boarded off to our minds unless the Lord breaks down those walls of comprehension. So this is a prayer that we would have strength to comprehend a prayer that we would have the strength to see. A prayer that we would have the strength to understand. In other words, the assumption is our mind is limited to seeing God's love unless he opens it. Unless he lets us see it. So Paul is praying, open their minds. Give them strength in verse 18. And notice also that this request is for them with all the saints. Together with the church. He is praying that together they would have an expansion of mind to comprehend something. And then he goes poetic and expansive and he says, what I'm praying that they would have strength to comprehend is the breadth and length and height and depth, and I believe this just carries on into the next phrase, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. The passage is filled with thoughts that ought to humble us, followed by requests that ought to exhilarate us. You don't have the comprehension to even know the extent of God's love for you. And by the way, the extent of that love is, it's not you uniquely, it's beyond knowledge. It's beyond knowledge. It's beyond understanding. You don't have the capacity as a human being, and I don't either, to know the unknowable unless God, who knows all things, reveals it to us. So Paul is praying that we would know the unknowable, that we would fathom the unfathomable, that we would explore the infinite, which is the love of Christ. He's praying that we would know God's love. Now, Paul imagines the scope of the love of Christ extending into all directions. He wants them to comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth. It's as if Paul metaphorically imagines arrows going in all directions and infinitely he's saying whatever direction you go, However you would conceive of God's love as being limited in your life, I I want you to explore every point of the compass, every situation, every circumstance, every type of person, every type of difficulty, every type of sin. I want you to explore it all so that you can understand the fullness of the infinite nature of the love of Christ. Now we need to know the expanse of the love of Christ so that we do not count ourselves or anyone else outside of its capacity to reach. The love of Christ goes in every direction, in every situation we can imagine. It it searches out the worst prodigal. It covers the people from every tribe and nation. It endures through the longest trial. It is deeper than the deepest of sins. There is the love of Christ. In height, it is beyond the stars above us, which were made by Christ. So the love of Christ must be higher than them. In depth, it is deeper than the deepest ocean, which is held in the palm of Christ. So therefore, it must be deeper than them. How great must be the love of the one who crafted the stars and carved out the oceans with his hands. How great must be the love of that one to go beyond our imagination. We need this because we are prone, according to this prayer, to have a narrow view, a limited view, a short view of God's love. And if you don't believe that, then you're questioning the prayer of Paul and why God put this prayer in the Bible. Here's the, here's the preachers call it the fallen condition focus. The, the, the need that this passage is addressing, it is that Christians have too narrow a view of God's love. Now you have to believe that that's true of you for you to receive the full weight of this passage. You have to agree with the Bible that I need God 
to show me more of his love because I haven't seen it all yet. You have to believe that. You have to accept that as God's word. Now, how much you've heard about God's love, you've read books about it, you've heard sermons about it, you've sung 9,000 songs about it, but your, your view is limited. You've crawled back out, and your heavenly Father has said, you haven't seen it all yet, and you need to. We need this. The narrow view of God's love is dangerous. It is a need that must be remedied, and here it is remedied by a prayer. We see a narrow view of God's love at work, even in the scriptures. Jonah, for example, thought that the love of God should not be broad enough to reach the Ninevites, so he was angry that God showed them mercy. He had a a narrow view of God's love. The older brother didn't know that the love of Christ was broad enough to include his prodigal brother, But it was. Jesus Christ's love is broad. It is deep. It is long. It is broad enough for those like John Newton, who was a slave trader and frankly a despicable sinner, and yet Christ's love reached him. This love is broad enough for addicts. It's broad enough for abortionists. It's broad enough for felons. It's broad enough for those who have pursued homosexualism and transgenderism. It's broad enough to even include repenting Pharisees and tax collectors and bring them together into the same flowing stream. This is the infinite love of Christ. It's not indulgence. It doesn't ignore sin. No, actually, it changes sinners into repentant sinners who lay claim on this love and the mercy that it offers. How does Christ's love go above and beneath and beyond and around anything we can imagine? Our smallest problem is is not too small for the love of Christ. Our greatest sin is not too great for the love of Christ. Our darkest hopelessness, our darkest thoughts are carried in his arms of love. Our deepest fears are born to the heights by his love. This, this is Paul's prayer. P- Paul, Paul has no doubt that the love of Christ is infinite. That, that's, that's not in question. He, he, he says, he states it as a fact that there is a height and a depth and a length and a width of the love of Christ. What, what he's praying is that we would have the mind to comprehend that. He sees us as as a child with blinders on staring at the foot of the rocky mountains and saying yes i know you're impressed but i, I you need to see more i'm i'm glad you're impressed with god's love but i'm i'm not making up how great this is You need to see more. We we need to have the Lord expand your peripheral vision, the height of your vision, the depth of your vision. We, we We need to get you up in the air to see the scope, the magnificent scope of the love of God. When I lived in Colorado, I couldn't do this very often because it's expensive, but I would go skiing maybe once a year. And and the mountains are beautiful if you've ever been there. They're beautiful to see from the plain when you're looking at the mountains, you're looking west and so forth. When you get up in them, at, at first you're, you're surrounded, you can't really see as much because there's cliffs around you and mountain peaks and everything you're driving there. But then when you get on these ski lifts and they carry you up to the top of a peak and you get there and there, From the vantage point of that peak, you can look out and see peak after peak. They go on forever. Peak after, and you're aware because you've been down in there. Every peak, there's a little valley. Every peak is massive granite stone walls reaching high up into the heavens, it would seem. And they're beautiful, and they're snow covered, and there's pine dotted everywhere. And you see the clouds rolling in. You can see. That's one mountain range made by the Christ who has infinite love. Try to expand your mind. 
include in that vision not only the Rocky Mountains, but the Alps, the Himalayas. And by the way, this is just one planet. Let's expand to the other planets in this galaxy alone. How many mountain ranges have never been seen? How many ocean depths have never been explored, never plumbed by the human eye? How many galaxies have how many planets with how many vistas and sights all created by this Christ? This is the infinite Christ who is loving. How infinite must his love be? And Paul is saying, give them strength. Their their eyes, their spiritual sight is limited. Give them perspective of the love of Christ. Do you consider one of your greatest problems to be that you do not know the greatness of the love of Christ? Do you consider one of your greatest needs to be a greater knowledge of the love of Christ? If you were to list out major prayer requests. Would this make the list? According to Paul, it should. It should. He is earnestly interceding, humbly bowing his knees, crying out in part that the very riches of God's glory himself, by the very strength of the Almighty Spirit, God would give them the capacity to see the love of Christ. P.G. O'Brien, quoting Don Carson, says, we cannot be, listen, we have to believe this. We cannot be as spiritually mature as we should be. We cannot be as spiritually mature as we should be unless we are empowered by God to grasp the limitless dimensions of the love of Christ. Show me your love ought to be the prayer and the heart of a Christian. Show me your love. Show me the heights of it, the depths of it, the length of it, the breadth of it. Show me your love. Consider the dangers if we don't see The fullness of the love of Christ. A narrow view of Christ's love will, will make us despondent in our sins. We'll think that our sins are deeper than his love for us. It will make us reluctant in our prayers and sluggish in our Christian duties. Because we wonder always, always, we wonder whether his love is great enough. A low view of Christ's love will make us idolize the love of others. To be loved by others is a good thing. It's a good thing to be loved by others. But how often are we tempted to crave the love of others, to be in a despair or rage, depending on your personality, when they fall short in their love toward us? How often can we live in insecurity if we haven't felt the love of those around us, but if our hearts are overflowing with the infinite love of Christ, then we are free to love others rather than idolize their love toward us. We are not bound by the questions of their perspective about us because we are overwhelmed by the love of Christ. A person overflowing with the love of Christ is free from the idolatry of reputation. A person overflowing with the love of Christ is free from the idolatry of reputation. Reputation with a boss, with a spouse, with a child, with a neighbor online. Because we have been plunged into the greatest depth that could be given the love of Christ. A a limited view of Christ's love will make us fearful of suffering. Will make us anxious about the powers that might be arrayed against us. Isn't that the same point Paul is making to the Romans when he says that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor anything else in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why is that? Because nothing is deeper than his love. 
Nothing is stronger than his love. Nothing is higher than his love. Not Caesar, not Hitler, not modern day tyrants, not the declining morality of our culture. No, it is not deeper than the love of God in Christ. So Paul makes the point, therefore, therefore, why are we afraid if we really believe and see the love of Christ Jesus our Lord? So a true and growing view of his love gives us security when we might be fearful. It makes us peaceful when the fear of man would prove to be a snare. It makes us hopeful even when we have to confess our wrongdoing. We confess it to the one who is overflowing with love towards us. Displeased by our sin, of course, but overflowing with love. Christ loves us infinitely. What else do we need? Nothing. It is in knowing this love that we learn to love him. How often do you feel, and I feel, that the love of Christ grows cold so quickly? It's distracted by other things so quickly. But when we know a person loves us beyond anything we could imagine, beyond the height of the heavens and the depths of the sea, when we truly see and feel that love, when we know it more and more and more, well, then we love that person back. We don't wish to grieve them or betray them. We love to love Christ when we see his love for us. So, we should pray, show us your love. Because that love that we need, without which we'll have all those vulnerabilities and with which we'll have all of those strengths, we don't have the power to see on our own. We can't fly over its lengths and heights. We can't plunge its depths. We don't have the strength. So Paul prays to the God who by his very riches and by the almighty spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that they who are limited and earthbound would be given strength to see what is unknowable on their own. Listen, there is something glorious for you to know that you cannot know on your own, thus prayer. It's the point of prayer again and again and again. You must be, you want to be, you ought to be, God has prepared for you to be what you can't be, so you pray. And here, could there be a more exciting invitation to pray than the prayer God himself has given us that we would pray to see his love? I mean, what better motive for prayer than that God says, I want you to ask me to show you my love. I want you to ask me that according to the riches of my glory, I will show you my love. I want you to ask me who can do more than we ask or imagine to show me your love. How absurd to be some sort of self-righteous, independent Westerner who thinks I don't need anything. Oh no, you, you need the love of God. Paul says we must pray for it. We must pray for it so that we are secured in it, strengthened by it, motivated by it. As we pray, how, how probably will God's love be revealed to us normally? How normally will God reveal his love to us? Well, he will do it as we study his word. The spirit works in concert with his word. Let, let, let me encourage you, study those sections of scripture that are designed in particular way to highlight and emphasize the love of Christ. Study the book of Hosea which is designed to illuminate the love of Christ. Study especially the cross of Christ, which is designed to reveal the expanse of Christ's love. Love that goes to the depths of our sin and raises us to the height of heaven that is as broad as the nations, as deep as the sea. That 
is the display of Christ's love. There is no comparison to anything else. How, how will God reveal his love? Most likely, he will reveal it in the scriptures, and in particular, as you study the death of Christ for sinners. There we will see the love of Christ, the love of the shepherd who loves the lost sheep, the love of the one who goes after the prodigal, the love of the one who bore our sins in his body, the love of the one who has mercy that is new every morning. There we will see the love of Christ. So we pray and we go there and we say, show me your love. I I believe also we'll see God's love when we are looking for it in the providences of life. In the scriptures, at the cross, yes, primarily, but also in the providences of life. The love of Christ towards you is everywhere. If you are praying for eyes to see it. The the love of Christ is revealed toward you in little blessings that sustain your day. In little relational gifts. In in tender mercies and in difficult trials that force you back to to him so you see more of Christ's love and are less enamored with the loves of this world. The love of Christ is revealed in us when we are exposed in our sinfulness because he sees us heading towards death and destruction and calls us back. The love of Christ is seen in in pleasant everyday things like the light of the sun and the warmth that he gives to this world. It's seen in in children that are given to us that we do not deserve, in spouses that love us despite ourselves, in friends that care about us and are interested in our well-being. The love of Christ is seen everywhere if we have eyes to see it. And since we don't, we ought to pray for it. This prayer ought to also motivate us to pray that others like Paul did. He's praying for someone else to see the love of Christ. Do you have a friend who is fearful? Pray that they would be secured by a growing knowledge of the love of Christ. Do you have a friend that is unsaved? They need to see the love of Christ reaching out to rescue them from their sins. Are you seeing a hard-heartedness toward the Lord in your spouse, in your husband or wife? Pray that they would see the love of Christ and it would break through the hardness of heart. Do you see an arrogance, a self-confidence, a self-wisdom in your young person or teenager at home? Pray that they would see the love of Christ. That it would break through that pride. That that they would no longer be enamored of their own opinion because they're so overwhelmed by the love of Christ. Pray for your pastors to see more of the love of Christ so that we can preach and teach it more deeply. Pray for your grandchildren to know more of the love of Christ so that they are protected from the seducing love of the world. Pray that we as a church would know the love of Christ and that it would cause us to worship him and witness to him. Listen, knowing the fullness of Christ's love apparently doesn't come passively or even automatically once you're a believer. We need God to be gracious so that we can see it and know it. And we need to come to that prayer with faith that it is true of God, that he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us so that he would receive glory in the church when the church basks in the increasing awareness of the infinite fullness of the love of Christ. Pray. Show me your love. Show me your love, Lord. Show me it in all of its infinite beauty. And then show me more. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would bring this prayer to mind this week. 
when we're conscious of insecurities and temptations and vulnerabilities of soul, I pray that this would be one of the things we pray. Show us your love. I pray, Lord, when we are feeling deeply convicted by our sins, that we would pray. Show us your love. When we are aware of our temptations, we would pray. Show us your love. Lord, when we are burdened by the vulnerabilities and weaknesses and sins of those around us that we love, Lord, bring this prayer to mind. Show them your love, Lord. Show us more. By faith we believe there is more to see.